My name is Matt Baker. I'm a member of the steering committee and I'm the science director for the North Pacific Research Board. And I wanted to welcome all of you to uh, the first session uh, of several that will be going on over the next few days. So I'm going to lead off with the first talk. Um, this is on, more generally on Aleutian's research, uh, just an overview on the region and then um, some of the investments that the North Pacific Research Board uh, has made over the last uh, essentially 14 years in the region. And part of the reason for that is we're looking to define some of the research priorities for the organization um, and uh, get some of the priorities from community members, from industry, uh, from researchers, and uh, help have you define uh, what some of the priorities for research is in this particular region as we move forward into uh, future planning. Um, so just as a background, I think most people here are more familiar uh, with the region than I am. Uh, the Aleutians are comprising a, quite a long archipelago uh, of several islands. It's about 3,000 kilometers between uh, Alaska and Russia. Um, there's strong interactions here between the shelf and deep sea habitats. And this region also forms the border, southern border of the Bering Sea. And so it regulates a lot of the interactions that you see be between the North Pacific generally and then uh, the Bering Sea and the Arctic further north of that. Um, the islands are largely submarine volcanoes, so that means uh, relatively steep slopes and a narrow shelf. And uh, some of the stressors uh, to the region and the environment include shipping, uh, military operations, fishing pressures, and uh, climate. So uh, one of the reasons that uh, my organization is interested in uh, this sort of dialogue um, out here in on Alaska um, is that the Aleutian Islands is one of the least studied ecosystems um, in Alaska, and it's pretty unique in a, a lot of different ways. So you have food webs that are dominated by uh, ocean processes. There's uh, much more energy going through the pelagic or the water column uh, portion of the environment. Um, you have regional scale dynamics, and you also have very localized scale dynamics in this region. And you have a gradient of depth-defined habitats as you move offshore um, from, from land. Um, you also have some unique uh, dynam dynamics in terms of wind, so you have downwelling and upwelling on opposite sides of the island chain. And then wind advection and transport and flow all interact in some unique ways that influence um, currents and flow beyond this region uh, up in the Bering Sea and ultimately up into the Arctic. Um, Part of the reason for talking about the Aleutians as a unique system is that the Bering Sea and the Aleutians are often combined for management purposes, so stocks are typically managed on that basis. Um, but there's some important ecological differences between the regions. Um, the Aleutian Islands shelf uh, systems are, are essentially the opposite of what the Bering Sea is. The Bering Sea, you have a broad, wide shelf, uh, and in the Aleutians, you have uh, a very narrow and, and a deep uh, uh, bathymetry. Um, also the composition of species in this area are different from the Bering Sea and th those that are the same are playing often fairly different roles in this ecosystem. Uh, and then socioeconomically there's also some differences too. So just given the geography, local communities are uh, more widely dispersed uh, and separated uh, and there's a high dependency on the nearshore environment. So uh, I'll just talk a little bit about ecosystem structure and uh, some of the management and then go into some of the areas where uh, the North Pacific Research Board has funded research in the past. Um, you have several different management regions um, in, uh, that comprise the area around the Aleutians and uh, sort of three major uh, distinct regions. One in the eastern area where you have um, narrow passes, uh, they're relatively shallow and long. You have a lateral mixing of water and the pr predominant uh, oceanographic feature is the Alaska Coastal Current. In the center you have passes that are wide, deep and short. You have more vertical mixing uh, and then bi-directional flow in the passes and the prominent uh, source of water there is the Alaska Stream. And then in the west, um, the Alaska Stream moves up northern uh, the passes are wide and deep, and there's relatively flu uh, few islands in that area. 
There's been some food web dynamic models. Um, this is done through the resource ecology uh, and environmental uh, modeling team at the Alaska Fishery Science Center. Uh, Yvonne Ortiz, uh, who's sitting right in front of me, uh, is one of the authors on this. Uh, these are food web uh, diagrams that look at pelagic and benthic flow. So benthic energy uh, from lower trophic levels or uh, the lower part of the ecosystem to the upper on the left and then uh, pelagic inputs uh, from the right. And if you look, I'm just gonna compare the three systems of the Bering, the Gulf, and the Aleutians. If you look at the uh, Bering Sea, while well, Pollock is really a dominant player uh, higher up in the ecosystem, if you look at the Gulf, you have more of a pelagic flow than a benthic flow, and you have three main players, or, um, or multiple main players in that system. So it's not just Pollock, but you also have capelin and some forage fish. Uh, as well as arrowtooth flounder as a, as a major predator. And then if you compare that to the Aleutians, it's even more diverse here. And so you have an even higher pelagic flow, um, and you have a whole suite of species up at the top. So you have mctophid fish, uh, relatively uh, mid to, to deep water fish. You have squid. Uh, you still have pollock and cod, but also acamacral, grenadiers. You have sculpins. Uh, Pacific Ocean perch and a range of rockfish. So a very different uh, system in the Aleutians from a fishery standpoint. Um, so now to go through some of the areas that um, we've uh, invested in research in the past and I'll move up from oceanography up into higher uh, levels in the system up through, um, uh, but focus on areas that are related to fisheries. Um, so Phyllis Stabino and Gleb Pantaleev were funded uh, several years back, um, looking at Aleutian Pass's uh, circulation. So they were using hydrographic data, um, drifters, uh, and current meters, uh, along with some satellite information to look at what's the exchange between the Aleutian Passes and then what's the impact of um, those dynamics on some of the large-scale currents that you see up in the Bering Sea. Um, David Musgrave and Al Herman uh, were funded for uh, some projects looking at um, what do we know about ocean circulation. Some of these models have been updated since then. Um, but what are some of the mixing and what are some of the exchange pro uh, processes that are driven by either some of the forcing mechanisms, so winds or tides, ice, uh, freshwater flow, and then the, the static features, the topographic features such as um, shelf break passes and, and coastlines. Um, we've also funded some research uh, looking at habitat. Um, Doug Woodby, John Heifetz, and Jennifer Reynolds looked at uh, 17 different sites, looked uh, at about 2,500 kilometers uh, from depths from about zero to 4,000 meters to identify areas uh, of coral habitat and sponge. Um, so they collected information uh, on the areas shown in the map on the bottom and developed some predictive models uh, looking at coral and sponge distribution and how those related to different environmental factors uh, and attributes where they were found. Um, there was also some work done by uh, Stephen Jewett and Chris Way Thomas looking at uh, the effects of the Kasatoshi volcano, um, which uh, erupted uh, 80 kilometers north of ADAC. Um, that changed the shoreline of that island and also had some impacts in the uh, near environment. So they developed a baseline study to look at um, what were some of the acute impacts right after that um, eruption and then uh, have developed a long-term study uh, to look at um, some of the ecological responses that we'll see over time and how those, how those shift over time. Uh, Mark Zimmerman and Chris Ruper at the Alaska Fisheries Science Center for NOAA um, did some work uh, looking at um, habitat that's critical to juvenile rockfish in the Aleutians. So they were looking at uh, five different uh, study sites indicated there on the map um, using uh, some side beam, uh, or sorry, multi beam sonar and side scan sonar. Uh, and then they ground truth that by using underwater videos. And what they found was that juvenile uh, Pacific Ocean perch were typically associated with sand and, and boulder substrate and were typically no more than a body length away uh, from some complex structure features such as boulders, corals, and sponges. So they were looking at what is the importance of structure to uh, juvenile uh, Pacific Ocean perch. 
They also found that some of the essential habitats um, could be uh, estimated by some of the large-scale mapping projects that have been done uh, to characterize habitat in the region. Uh, MARC is uh, currently funded to improve some of the Aleutian Islands uh, bathymetry using National uh, Oceanographic Survey smooth sheet uh, soundings, and uh, Wayne Paulson's going to talk a little bit about that later on uh, this morning. So we also fund quite a bit of research looking at fish and invertebrates, uh, particularly those that are related to commercial uh, subsistence or recreational interest. Um, one of the studies that we funded was for Andre Punt looking at uh, a suite of crab stocks in the Aleutian Islands. Um, this was designed to develop and apply methods for refining some of the reference points that are used in management um, for six stocks that were in a tier four status, and that's a status related to sort of uh, how much is known, how much data is available for uh, those stocks. Uh, I apologize, I, I'm actually not sure which um, crab stock the graphic refers to, but this is looking at mature male biomass um, across um, roughly a, a 50 year time frame. Um, Andre was also funded <coughs> to look at um, a suite of different crabs um, using uh, tagging data uh, to estimate growth. So crab, uh, several different species are managed according to size structured models. So uh, the uh, number of animals in a certain size uh, category or age category are uh, used as a way to improve models um, to forecast um, the recruitment or the uh, abundance of those animals over time. Uh, this is showing the Aleutian, king, uh, Aleutian uh, golden king crab on the top and western Aleutian golden king crab on the bottom. It's looking at catch as a function of exploitation rate. Um, and so he had done uh, a suite of different models to try and look at um, how to incorporate growth information into some of these age structured models. Um, we also funded uh, Ingrid Spies uh, and Steve uh, Kalowinski. Um, Ingrid is at uh, NOAA as well, uh, looking at Pacific Cod. So there's some evidence through some tagging data um, uh, and uh, other sources that there may be some stock differentiation in Pacific Cod in the region. So they developed a uh, metapopulation genetics uh, model and uh, found that there's three distinct regions. It was actually uh, the breakpoints were different than what they had expected. They had anticipated that some of the deep passes would have been the breakpoints for where uh, you saw the uh, separation between the stocks given how larvae would be transported. What they found was that there's a distinct stock up in the Pribilovs, uh, one at Unimac Pass, and then um, most of the stocks in the central to western Aleutians are, are all within that same uh, population. Um, we funded uh, Suzanne McDermott, who's at NOAA as well, and she's actually in this session. Unfortunately, she uh, is not here yet. We're hoping that she will be here. She's also running a workshop at the end of, of the week. Um, Suzanne had been doing uh, a variety of different studies on Atka mackerel and other fish in the region. Um, this one was looking at uh, reproductive ecology, so they're looking at some of the attributes of egg development um, and larvae. Um, and also looking in the context of um, where some of these important spawning habitats were, um, what the important areas were for recruitment and distribution, and how that relates to uh, stellar sea lion distribution, which is one of the dominant predators for this fish. Um, and Aca mackerel are, are one of the dominant food sources to stellars, um, as well as um, how those overlapped with some of the areas that have been closed to trawling. Um, Suzanne was part of a broader study along with Peter Monroe, uh, Libby Lagerwell, and Todd Loomis. Um, this was uh, integrating uh, work with commercial fisheries to try and look at tag recoveries uh, for Aca mackerel and looking at local scale phenomena. So these stocks are managed on a very broad scale, um, but some of the important dynamics related to life history for these fish, um, as well as local depletion from fisheries, uh, happens on much more finite scales. So they were looking at uh, what is the overlap between Aca mackerel and uh, where they're moving um, with uh, some of the trawl exclusion zones as well as the uh, stellar sea lion population. So that sort of starts to bridge into fisheries interactions. How do uh, the biology and some of the important metrics related to exploitation um, 
interact and in what ways can we, can we predict those? <coughs> Um, Phyllis Stabenow, Libby Lagerwell, and, and others at uh, the NOAA uh, Alaska Fisheries Science Center had been doing uh, work using ES-60 echo sounders. Again, this was a collaboration with industry where they put NOAA boats out as well as industry boats with <coughs> um, that equipment. Um, and they were looking at acoustic surveys of Pollock uh, and then collecting data on sea lion distribution and habitat as well to look at, at that overlap. Um, a similar study, again, with Suzanne, um, was looking at um, small-scale abundance and movement of Aca mackerel in the western Aleutians. Um, and uh, they looked at some seasonal differences, so they uh, looked not only in the summer, um, which is typically when a lot of data uh, for fisheries is collected, but also looked at the winter um, and tried to look at uh, the relative abundance of ground fish prey that would be available to stellar sea lions. Um, so we're also funding some research that are trying to look at ecosystem indicators. So how uh, are there certain attributes or trends that we can use to predict how systems might change over time? Um, and one of the best examples of that are, is birds. So birds are important in their own right as a component of the system, but they're also a really useful tool in terms of uh, using them as a way to sample the environment, using them uh, either planktivorous birds that are eating uh, low down on the food chain or uh, piscivorous birds uh, to look at distributions of fish, to look at uh, trends um, from their diet, uh, and also using the population dynamics of the birds themselves to look at uh, how the environment might be shifting over time. So several um, studies with Bill Seideman and Alan Sp Springer, as well as Ian Jones, uh, looking at some of those attributes. Um, we also looked at uh, some forage fish themselves. This again was John Pyatt um, with a suite of folks at USGS and, else, and, and elsewhere um, looking at uh, juvenile walleye pollock, uh, Pacific sandlands, and capelin um, throughout the uh, eastern Aleutians and the peninsula. Um, their premise was that these fish uh, populations are really patchy and sh sort of short-lived in terms of where the fish are at any given time. So they were pairing uh, hydroacoustics with trawls as well as some nearshore uh, beach sand sampling and uh, also collected data on the oceanography and plankton in the, in the region um, and compared uh, how some of these forage fish, um, uh, which are also in many cases important subsistence species um, were, were changing uh, relative to the environment. Uh, Julia Parrish um, is a University of Washington professor who's been developing the Coastal Observation and Seabird Survey Team, that's COAST, which is designed to use citizen scientists um, to train community members um, really around the whole Pacific Northwest on a rigorous approach to going out and looking at uh, seabird death, deaths along beaches um, and uh, maintain that as a way to monitor these systems over time. And so that's been going on uh, down in Oregon and Washington and BC for a long time. It was extended more recently up into um, the Pribilof Islands, into Cold Bay uh, and elsewhere on uh, the peninsula, um, as well as Seward, Homer, and Sitka. <coughs> And this project was uh, designed to extend that um, to communities in Kenai, Kodiak, Juneau, um, a suite of other uh, communities, including on Alaska. And so this is uh, designed to be something that uh, carries on beyond the, the range of the project, where you actually have a system set up um, with local people trained on how to do that and how to train others, and uh, be a really efficient way to monitor these systems over time over a really wide uh, geographic scope. And then uh, we also have some research focusing more on ecosystem dynamics. Uh, this includes uh, research that was uh, led by Pat Livingston, who's uh, the former director for the Resource Ecology and Fisheries Management Division at NOAA. Um, what they were doing was taking a suite of uh, stomach sample um, diet uh, analyses, essentially, and putting that into multi-species models. They developed a suite of different models, um, including a multi-species virtual population analysis, a multi-species forecast model, and a multi-species uh, statistical model. Uh, those have been further developed and refined over time, but the idea is to look, rather than looking just simply at single species, um, which is typically how 
um, we're managing stocks and, and figuring out reference points and, and quotas and catch limits. Um, looking at how these species interact and if we can understand some of the dynamics of the system a little bit better that way. Uh, Jim Overland, who's at the Pacific Marine Environmental Lab, um, had done a study um, which he uh, entitled looking, at, looking for black swans. And the idea of a black swan is uh, something that you're not expecting. Um, an example might be a financial uh, stock market crash or population crash for fisheries, uh, his argument was that those events are actually fairly similar. They're usually events that people don't predict very well, uh, that are fairly uh, catastrophic or uh, have large implications for a variety of different people. Uh, and so he wanted to look and see, are there some ways that we can use uh, long-term data, retrospective data, to uh, figure out how to predict those types of uh, major ecosystem shifts that have uh, large impacts for the system as well as the people that depend on it um, and uh, find some uh, predictive capacity for uh, looking at when we might expect to see shifts like that. And then we also have some research uh, on a variety of different areas in human dimensions. Um, Mike Downs was doing a uh, study uh, providing a template for the collection and the analysis of uh, community profile information for fishing communities uh, through the region. And the idea for this was to provide resource managers uh, with information that was relevant to understanding impacts on communities. Um, and then also to provide information on how engaged communities were and how dependent they were on particular uh, fisheries, uh, particularly federally managed commercial fisheries. Um, Surrey Sethi and Gunnar Knapp, um, working out of uh, University of Alaska Anchorage were, and uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service were looking at um, some economics data. So they were taking uh, publicly available uh, data. So this would include uh, permit ownership, uh, demographics on fishing communities, uh, fleet age, income, uh, and population dynamics. And they developed some trends, statewide trends, uh, on the graph on the right, uh, looking at uh, catch, um, real revenue, and then uh, X vessel price over time. Uh, this is aggregate over Alaska and across fisheries, but then they broke that down into discrete fisheries and discrete regions. And the map on the left shows um, the number of active fisheries in different regions, and they also looked at uh, some of the risk factors, um, how varied uh, different regions were and invested in a suite of different fisheries or how dependent a community might be on a single fishery or a single stock. Um, and then we have some programs that are uh, designed to work directly with communities or ideally to have communities um, develop the ideas and uh, put forward proposals um, on issues that are of importance to them. Uh, and similarly with industry, uh, cooperative research with industry where uh, we're looking for a fusion between uh, academic or agency researchers or independent researchers and industry uh, using industry knowledge and also using industry platforms to, to look at uh, some uh, forward science in ways that we can't do um, if you don't have those sort of uh, linkages. So one example uh, was Meredith uh, Mar Marcioni and Matthew Berman. Um, they were looking at some ecological and sociological cultural changes that were affecting uh, small Alaska or Aleutian subsistence communities. Um, how some of those residents and those communities were adapting their practices in, uh, in, re in response to the changes that they were experiencing, and how communities could use that information themselves to look at the viability of some of the different uh, strategies and, and practices that they were doing in terms of responding to change. Um, so this was designed to develop some current subsistence uh, harvesting and processing practices and then look at um, what were some of the most important ecological or economic or uh, cultural factors that were uh, being influenced by the changes that they were seeing uh, in the physical environment. Uh, there was a large study uh, uh, put forth by Northern Economics. Um, some folks who are here probably participated in this. Um, this was an analytic framework um, to look at uh, social and ecological, uh, and sorry, economic implications of moving to rights-based um, fisheries or capacity reduction, so limits um, related to management. And so there were three communities here, uh, King Cove on Alaska and uh, Akatan. 
I have this report here. It's extremely ex in t uh, extensive. It's something like 600 pages, but it's on a PDF. So if people are interested, uh, especially in, in the Unalaska portion, I I'm happy to share that as well. It's a little bit old at this point, but I think still a useful reference. Um, and then uh, in terms of an example of cooperation with industry, Chris Sidden, who's at Alaska Department of Fish and Game, uh, has been working with industry um, to do a tagging study on golden king crab. Um, right now, there's a distinction in stocks that's based essentially on effort, so where the fleet is. Um, but there's some evidence that there are actually some uh, genetic or stock differentiation between uh, the, uh, the areas where golden king crab are spread. And so the, the idea there is to uh, better characterize stock structure in golden king crab and uh, improve some management. Um, so it's, it's, been a very it's been a very successful cooperation, I think, with industry on that. Um, so that's just a brief overview. It's not comprehensive of some of the research that we've done out here, but um, in terms of where North Pacific Research Board takes ideas, um, we have a request for proposals that comes out every year. Um, one of the things that we try and do is really open up um, the development of that document to incorporate ideas from outside groups. So that includes community priorities or interests, uh, industry interests, um, the management uh, agency priorities and priorities from individual research institutes and individual researchers. And so uh, we have a online submission and we're, uh, that's open uh, for research ideas uh, for anyone. Uh, we've closed that now uh, for this year, but it will be up again uh, in June of next year and open through the summer. Um, and I would uh, encourage anyone who uh, is interested in starting that conversation uh, at this point in attending session seven. That's a stakeholder and listening synthesis uh, that we're doing with the refuge um, between one and 4.30. It's a facilitated discussion, so uh, we'll have some help in trying to get ideas from the audience, but um, any ideas would be welcome at that point, so thanks.